Hi everyone and welcome back to my YouTube channel. In this video I will give a detailed timeline of one of the world's most famous or possibly infamous automobile. This timeline is about the Bonnie and Clyde death car. On May 28, 2021 at the authentic Bonnie and Clyde Festival in Gibson, Louisiana, I presented this timeline to the audience. Please stay tuned to the end of this video and I will discuss the annual Bonnie and Clyde Festival in Gippsland. It's a lot of fun and I'll give you all the details so that you can join us there. As with Bonnie and Clyde, their death car also is surrounded with controversy and questionable details. All of us are aware of what happened 87 years ago, May 23rd, 1934. We know the rest of the story of Bonnie and Clyde, but what about the car that Bonnie and Clyde was killed in. The death car has its own following and its own history. It's a piece of American history, and the car where two of the most well-known and loved Depression-era gangsters met their end. So now, let's begin with the timeline. January 1934, a specific 1934 four-door deluxe sedan model 730 was assembled by Ford. 85 horsepower V8 engine and a three-speed transmission. It was painted Cordoba Gray. Specially ordered with an inside Arvin water heater, model 80B, an oil bath air cleaner, steel spare tire cover, bumper guards, and a chrome Greyhound radiator cap. The motor number was 649198. It was assembled at Ford's River Rouge plant in Dearborn, Michigan. This was one of the largest automobile plants in the world, including 93 buildings and over 16 million square feet. During World War II, the River Rouge plant would make Jeeps, tanks, boats, and many more vehicles to help win the war. In addition to the side windows rolling down, they also slid back about two inches for ventilation. This 1934 Ford was shipped to Mosby Back Motor Company in Topeka, Kansas. March 15, 1934. This Ford was sold to Jesse and Ruth Warren. The sales price was $782.92. They bargained the salesman down from the sticker price of $832. The original license plate was Kansas 317. 832. The Warrens had saved their money for years to purchase this Ford and then planned on touring the country in their brand new Ford. For the first few weeks, the Warrens babied their car, not driving it over 20 miles per hour. April 29, 1934. This 1934 Ford was stolen by Clyde Barrow. At the time of the theft, the Ford had 1,243 miles on it. According to Ruth Warren, the theft occurred this way. And this is one of many versions that she would tell. Sunday afternoon, April 29th, she was on their front porch with her sister and another friend. They noticed a couple in a sedan kept circling the block. They didn't think much of it, thinking they were just lost. The female in the sedan was very small, barely being able to look out the window. The man driving the sedan had a swarthy face and looked twisted. The three women went into the house to tend to their sister's baby. Ruth received a telephone call from her husband asking her to come downtown to pick him up. Ruth gathered her purse and went outside, but their new Ford was gone. It was typical of the day just to leave the keys in the car. She called the police weeks later after they found out that the notorious barrel gang had stolen their car, Ruth cried. She said it was a shame that hardworking people like themselves saved so much money for a new car and then it was taken away by cheap gangsters. Warren's home address where the Ford was stolen was 2107 Gabler Street. The house is still there today. Sunday, May 20th, 1934, Dallas County Deputies Bob Alcorn and Ted Hinton were driving toward Arcadia, Louisiana on Highway 80. 
Frank Hamer and Manny Gault were behind the deputies in another vehicle. They were en route to Arcadia to make plans for the deadly ambush. As they were driving east through a construction zone about halfway between Shreveport and Gibson, Hinton observed a tan 1934 Ford four-door going west. Hinton recognized the pair in the Ford as Bonnie and Clyde. However, being unable to turn around due to the construction zone, the four lawmen continued their trip to Arcadia to meet with Sheriff Henderson Jordan. May 23, 1934, Bonnie and Clyde were ambushed near Gibson, Louisiana, while driving the Warren Ford. Clyde had driven the car nearly 7,600 miles in 25 days. The odometer read 8,827 miles, according to Ruth. The car carried an Arkansas license plate of 15368, which belonged to Merle Cruz of Fayetteville, Arkansas. Later that day, the death car was parked in the jail yard of the county jail in Arcadia. Sheriff Henderson Jordan immediately seized the car for evidence. For safekeeping, the sheriff called the local Ford dealer, Mr. Woodard, and convinced him to keep the death car in his garage. However, the crowd soon found out its location and the car was moved back to the jail yard. The sheriff then had the car moved to a barn just outside of Arcadia where it sat until it was ordered by a judge to be turned over to a United States Marshal. May 24, 1934, a member of the Associated Press from Dallas called Ruth Warren and asked the details of her stolen Ford. After she had given him the motor number, he confirmed to her that her 1934 Ford was the car that Bonnie and Clyde were ambushed and killed in. A few days later, Ruth Warren arrived in Arcadia, Louisiana to claim her car. Sheriff Henderson Jordan refused to release it to her, claiming that she would have to pay $15,000 to get it back. Warren quickly hired attorney W.D. Goff from Arcadia to represent her. Goff claimed that Jordan Setting the value of the car over $3,000, the court case would surely wind up in federal court. Because of Sheriff Jordan's refusal to comply, federal judge Benjamin Dawkins threatened to send the sheriff to jail if he did not return the car to Mrs. Warren. In his reply, Sheriff Jordan stated that he will return the chassis of the death car, but would retain the bullet-ridden body. June 15, 1934, Jesse Warren signed a contract with Duke Mills, who wanted to exhibit the death car at the Chicago World's Fair. Jesse signed the contract knowing that the death car was still in Arcadia and that there was a legal battle with the sheriff. June 29, 1934, Jesse Warren filed a federal lawsuit to get back the death car. Soon after the lawsuit was filed, the car was surrendered by Sheriff Jordan to Federal Marshal George W. Montgomery. The Marshal would take possession of the car, however, it would still remain in Arcadia. August 2, 1934, by order from a federal judge, the death car was returned to its original owners, Jesse and Ruth Warren. Once again, Ruth returned to Arcadia and took possession of the death car. She drove the car from Arcadia to Shreveport with bullet holes and blood still on the seats. Ruth stated that the odometer read 8,855 miles. The Bonnie Clyde death car left Arcadia, Louisiana, never to return. After the car was returned to the Warrens, they pursued connections to display the Ford. Just a few months after Bonnie and Clyde had been killed in the Ford, the Warrens knew that the public wanted to see the car. As early as August 1934, the Bonnie and Clyde death car already had its following. Through Charles Stanley, also known as the Crime Doctor, and the Department of Justice, they made arrangements for the car to tour the United States. President Roosevelt's War on Crime was in full mode and the car was needed to motivate citizens to help fight crime. 
The Warrens liked the fact that Stanley was from Kansas, their home state. Stanley was a circus businessman and a showman his entire life. He convinced the Warrens to rent and later sell him the death car. He then unveiled it as an attraction in his hometown of Abilene, Kansas. The date was September 18, 1934, less than four months after Bonnie and Clyde had been killed in it. Stanley became known as the crime doctor. He took the car on tour across the country. He exhibited at state fairs, carnivals, auto dealerships, which gave him free space in the hope that they could sell some of their cars to the crowd. Stanley even persuaded some of Bonnie and Clyde's family members to join the tour and expand his sideshow to include relics of the famous gangsters. But the death car was always the main attraction. In newspaper ads, Stanley promoted himself as an internationally known criminologist and urged ministers, local officials, and police everywhere to see the death car. Bring the children, the ads would say. The ads claim that his car, Sideshow, was working in conjunction with the president in a nationwide drive against crime. In 1940, Jesse and Ruth would divorce and Ruth would keep the death car, later selling it to Stanley for $3,500. That's about $65,000 today. Stanley toured with the car for a few more years, boasting that he had visited all 48 states. He then settled into a full-time job at a Cincinnati amusement park, bringing the car with him as an attraction. Gradually, the death car's popularity faded from the public. In his final year, Stanley returned to Abilene, Kansas, where he was befriended by a local photographer named Bill Jeffcoat. While Stanley owned the death car, he also collected items associated with the death car, which grew into a large number of objects. When Stanley died at age 93, he willed his death car collection to Jeff Coat, who was a professional photographer. When Jeff Coat died, his former camera shop was turned into the Jeff Coat Studio Museum in Abilene, Kansas, where Stanley's death car memorabilia was displayed. All of the death car items that were in the museum are no longer on display today. The museum does not have many items from Stanley's crime shows. Although Stanley died in 1996, the crime doctor still remains part of the death car history. His legacy is still visible on the death car. Bonnie and Clyde car, lettering, hand-painted on the hood. The crime doctor placed the death car on display in the states and many more. November 1934 in Texas. December 1934, Kansas. January 1935, Arkansas. March 1935, Oklahoma. July 1935, Nebraska. November 1935, Alabama. June 1936, Illinois. August 1936, Minnesota. February 1938, Louisiana, but not in Arcadia. February 1939, back to Texas. February 1940, Florida. In 1952, Ted Toddy bought the death car for $24,000. No one will ever know how much he actually paid for the death car. He claimed that he made $3,000 a week touring the car through the United States. In 1964, the death car was displayed at the New York World Fair. August 4th, 1967, something would happen that brought the death car back to the public's interest. It was the first release of the movie Bonnie and Clyde, starring Warren Beatty and Faye Dunaway. This movie would generate a renewed interest in the actual death car, as well as many imitation death cars. There are believed to be about seven imitation death cars around the country today. 1969, Ted Toddy insured the death car for $160,000 with Lloyd's of London Insurance Company. The 
car's odometer read 101,048 miles. Still carry license plate 317832 and at this time it still had the original tires on it. September 1969, Ted Hinton, the only surviving member of the ambush posse, testified in an Atlanta courtroom that Ted Toddy owned the one and only Bonnie and Clyde death car. Toddy brought the suit against Johnny Parkman, doing business as Johnny United Shows, for advertising that he owned the actual death car. July 28, 1973, Following the renewed interest from the movie, Bonnie and Clyde, Ted Toddy placed the death car up for auction. It was sold to Peter A. Simon, 22-year-old casino owner in Jean, Nevada, for $175,000. Peter Simon was involved in gambling games, gold investing, real estate. His father, Pop, created one of the first motel store gas station and casino complex in the mid-1940s in Nevada. Toddy claimed that the car has earned its owners over $10 million since 1934. $175,000 in 1973 is equal to a little over $1 million today. It was reported that prior to the auction, the highest amount paid for an antique auto was Hitler's Mercedes. It sold for $153,000. Ted Meyer Toddy died in Houston, Texas, 1983 at 83 years old. 1979, the ownership of the death car was transferred from Jim Brucken, owner of the movie world Cars of the Stars in California. Later, it would be sold to Clyde Wade of the Harris Car Collection. June 1987, the Great American Race. The race began in 1982 for pre-war manufactured vehicles, a cross-country trip from west to east. In 1987, the road trip was from Disneyland in California to Disney World in Orlando, Florida. By far the most popular entry in the 1987 Great Race was the Bonnie and Clyde death car. The driver was Jenny Withers, promoting Crime Does Not Pay along with the National Sheriff's Association. The car was extensively modified to participate in the Great Race. The windshield was replaced, tires and brakes, seat covers, and the complete drivetrain was modified for the race. The car did not win. The winner was a 1916 Mitchell. After the race, it was returned to its original condition with original parts. In 1988, the death car was sold to Whiskey Pete's Gangster Collection in Prim, Nevada for $250,000. The death car remains there today. January 15, 1998, historian and my friend, the late Sandy Jones, was allowed to inspect, photograph, and catalog the death car. He built an exact copy of the 1934 Ford from his research. The casino allowed him to enter the glass vault that the death car is in and examine every detail of the death car. Sandy was curator of the John Dillinger Historical Society Museum. You can view his amazing and detailed photographs on the Bonnie and Clyde Hideout website. Sandy died at his home in February 2018. He once owned John Dillinger's 1933 Terraplane. Well, that concludes my timeline of the infamous Bonnie and Clyde death car. If you have any questions, please write them in the comments below and I'll try to answer each of them. Now, let me briefly give you the details of the authentic Bonnie and Clyde Festival. The festival is held every May in Gippsland, Louisiana. Usually, it is held during the Memorial Day weekend. However, sometimes the dates do move. So be sure to check out the authentic Bonnie and Clyde Festival page on Facebook 
for exact dates. This Facebook page will give you plenty of details such as dates, times, and the schedule of events as they come available. The festival always starts with the Lorraine Joyner Historians Meeting with dinner and speakers on Friday night of the festival. Then on Saturday, there's fun, games, parade, and plenty of bank robbery shootouts. The grand finale is at the ambush at the actual site where Bonnie and Clyde were killed. So this May 2023, please join me at the authentic Bonnie and Clyde Festival at Gibson, Louisiana for a weekend full of fun and excitement. Thank you so much for watching my video. Please like, subscribe, comment, and share. Also, please visit my Facebook page for more true and original stories. You can find my books for sale on Amazon or just message me if you want autographed copies.